Podcast. My name is Billy Jennings. Um, I'm a friend of Kirby's, and Kirby is um, preparing to speak at a, a national conference on psychedelics. And he's going to go through with us, with us today a little bit of what he plans on sharing there. So, um, welcome and good morning, Kirby. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for switching seats and uh, being on the other side of the microphone. This is exciting. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to take this opportunity. To, um, it's a big opportunity at this conference in Arizona to sh share some of the work um, that we're doing here, uh, especially in as it relates to the, the molecule, the entheogen, the psychedelic, the sacrament, whatever word feels right for you of, of 5-MeO-DMT. Now, again, I think the neat part of this conference is, look, they're not bringing me out because I have a show on Vice TV. They're not bringing me out because I have a world famous podcast um, or I have a million followers. I mean, they're bringing me out because folks are starting to learn more about uh, myself and our organization and, and viewing us as this new guard um, that's essentially on the forefront of, uh, of change. Again, especially about how this medicine is collected how participants are prepared, served, and integrated, all of the above. Um, and then on top of that, again, uniquely, we think that uh, from an integration standpoint, it's not just an individual integration, but integrating with outside professionals, specifically if it's a uh, mental health provider. Um, and then on top of that, trying to create a community for folks to, uh, to heal in a trauma-informed way. So, Again, we're not world famous, um, but we are, again, on the forefront of the utilization of this medicine. It's the most potent, fast-acting uh, sacrament. It's, it's an energetic and release, to, and from my perspective, it's probably the highest, most intense energetic experience a human can have. Um, obviously, that would come with some risks, I and mean, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but... I mean, I guess the tricky part for me is um, you're looking at current, you know, current research, you know, USANA uh, Institute um, is in phase one studies. I think these are important phase one studies because they're actually using a placebo group as well to actually calculate what this uh, medicine is doing. And so far, mm -hmm. get some of the obvious uh, markers that we think that you would see, you know, the r rapid and sustained relief of depression, anxiety and stress. Um, but what I find even more importantly is some of the earlier reports on heightened improvement of enjoyment of life, but mindfulness. Like that's an interesting thing for them to measure for mindfulness. Mm -hmm. um, so the question I'd like to, to, to take on today for us to have the discussion about is how is this happening? Right? How is all this happening? And what else is happening that's not being officially studied, so to speak? And sure. so myself and my group, we consider ourselves citizen scientists. You're one of those. Um, and I guess that's the objective today is to share with you today, um, you know, how we're utilizing 5-MEO, uh, non-dual energetic therapy, um, and what we're seeing in the field. Yeah, sounds great. Um, let's just start with the basics and what is 5-MEO and going over a little bit about the molecule itself. Yeah, um, it's an important piece because, uh, you know, if you as I start this off, I'm always calling it 5-MeO-DMT. Um, it's 5-methoxyl-NN-dimethyltryptoline, or another accurate term would be nno trimethyl serotonin. Um, but for the sake of this, I'm just going to say 5-MeO-DMT. Um, that can confuse some folks. Again, just the word DMT is confusing for some folks. And again, that's why I think conferences like this are important. Um, so we can get some, some uh, information out there. And the main difference is, so again, when you say DMT, there's essentially two major ones that folks um, um, that come to folks mind. One would be, again, trippy, tricky term, terminology, we'll just refer to as traditional DMT, which is called mm -hmm. NN-dimethyltryptoline, which again, that's where it gets tricky with these names. People refer to it as traditional NN-dimethyltryptoline. That's not the most accurate name for it because the other DMT that we're talking about today is 5-MeO which is 5-methoxyl-NN-dimethyltryptoline. So they're both NN-dimethyltryptolines technically, but for the case of this, um, or for this conversation, I'm just gonna refer to it as 5-MeO. Um, but there's a significant difference between these two molecules. Um, again, it gets confused sometimes when you say DMT. I think the traditional um, 
DMT is more related with uh, like a Joe Joe Rogan and Terrence McKenna when folks are talking about DMT they want to see the wood elves et cetera yep. et cetera but the difference is uh, the serotonin receptors that they're impacting I mean um, traditional more common psychedelics are hitting the 5 HT 2A receptor and not to get too caught up into that but 5-MeO is hitting the 5-HT1A receptor by mm -hmm. 500 to 1,000 fold, which means that the experience is significantly different, um, not just by the way that the receptors are being targeted, but by the actual experience itself. Um, and anybody that's had a traditional uh, DMT experience will report it's extremely visual and colors mm -hmm. and movements. Um, there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot to see, so to speak. And with 5-MeO, again, because it's hitting this 1A receptor, it seems to be more of a significantly embodied experience versus a visual experience. So they couldn't be more different from a molecular standpoint and from an experiential standpoint. But today, let's just call it 5-MeO DMT, and we'll refer to the other as traditional DMT. Sounds fair. Um, so tell us how um, you came to this medicine and what was your experience? Yeah, uh, just just briefly, um, I'd say, I'm, you know, it's the every man's challenge, right? Um, you know, working, working 60 hours a week, struggling. Um, you know, I was at a stage where I felt I was successful. So I had met all the, the markers of society of success, right? I was making good money, had a good career. Um, had the house, had all the goodies, and uh, but yet, like again, the the average man, the every man, was just uncontent, unhappy, depressed, anxious, constantly. Each day was a was a struggle. Um, I had an opportunity to um, go do an ayahuasca ceremony. I did that. That was the beginning of the change, but it was just the beginning. I um, had an opportunity to work with that medicine for a couple years. And then I had an opportunity to do what, again, we refer to as traditional DMT. That was the goal anyway. I went to a, an event um, that was gonna serve some traditional DMT. I got there, they did not have traditional DMT. All they had was 5-MeO DMT. And I remember a story from my guru um, about her experience with 5-MeO, which is why I really had no interest in it, to be honest. Um, I remember she was going through some personal struggles. She went and did it. And when she came back, uh, we had a conversation. She said, you need to do this. And I was like, okay, well, well what did you see? Well, I didn't see anything. Okay, well, um, what did it do to you? I don't know what it did to me, but it did something to me. Okay. Um, was it scary? Yeah, it was absolutely horrifying, but you should do it. And uh, I just kind of put all that marketing material together and came to the conclusion that this is not something that I wanted to do. Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but my curiosity kind of probed me to watch some videos on it, which made it even less appealing to me. And anybody that's out there that's listening that's gone onto YouTube and typed in 5MEO experience, you'd understand what I'm saying. It's not um, graphically appealing. Um, so I had no interest in doing it. Um, but the universe works in mysterious ways as I'm standing there. Mm -hmm. Um, this beautiful lady Mirna, who I'm great friends with today, looked up at me and said, we don't have it, but you need to do Bufo. And again, I recalled all the conversation I just had, thought, no, this isn't anything I need to do. But with some persistence, um, I agreed to it. Um, and it was the, the most life-changing uh, decision I've ever made. Now, through that experience, and one of the reasons I, I, I share that is... Again, I had done ayahuasca for two years. I had done other entheogens for years and felt some level of healing, felt some level of, 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 of change, <clears throat> and it was there. But within five minutes um, of this molecule, I realized that there was levels to this. Um, and I realized instantaneously what this molecule had the ability to do. Um, from an ego standpoint, I was immediately aware of my ego from the standpoint of the programming. I could see it piecing itself back together. So ego awareness was number one. Number two was the somatic release. So when I was under the medicine, my body was vibrating old energetic patterns out of me. It could have been depression, anxiety, whatever it may be. Um, this concept of unity consciousness, mindfulness, which again, the report said it reported folks with this level of mindfulness, it changed the way that my brain operated almost immediately to the point that I had a calling 
or an attraction towards this silence, towards enlightenment, feeling this conscious space. Um, and again, I think that is to this, this high level mystical experience or a spiritual awakening, whatever term feels right, that this molecule could provide. And I think that's its power, is the consistency of being able to provide that experience. Ayahuasca, sure, you can have an ego death, you can have this um, mystical experience of spiritual awakening, all these things that I just discussed. But at a level to what I experienced and a level to what folks have experienced and the consistency of that, there is nothing matched. Mm -hmm. But the final lesson that I learned from that is what we are working with moving forward was this understanding, this immediate understanding that I was energy. That all mm -hmm. this program, and I realized that although I was in this Aya world, that I had just changed one prison for another, the prison of a financial advisor with a suit and tie to another prison that just had cooler beads and better music, right? But still a yeah. prison of ego, of role, of, of this identity of I am something. And immediately that was witnessed. Um, and so I took that a little bit further. Um, so when I went home, I started researching this, again, this program, because it, it became obvious to me that, boy, I wanted to make different decisions. When the guy cut me off, I didn't want to be upset. But why would I still be upset, even though I didn't want to be upset? And this whole concept of free will became um, intriguing to me, went down that rabbit hole. And we're all, I'll close with this, which is an important lesson, and maybe most of the folks listening already understand this. I think a lot don't. Free will is non-existent, okay? I know people don't like to hear that, but I say all the time, look, if you're angry or you're depressed today or you're anxious or you're in any mood that you don't want to be in, well, use some of that free will that you think you have and stop it, right? If you have free will, you should be able to stop that. Why can't you, right? And to me, that became obvious, like, Kirby, you're programmed. That's program. And then sure enough, the science backs it for the first six to seven years of your life, your brain's in this theta range, which is this hypnotic state. You're just absorbing information um, for survival, right? That's part of evolution. And mm -hmm. then you become conscious and you press play on that program and you start playing this programming out as if it's you. It is a program and people spend their entire lives. And that was me defending this program, making sure people were aware that this program was in existence. Do you see my program? And are you aware of it and not realizing that it's just another prison? So, yes. Um, yeah, that's a beautiful story of coming to the medicine, honestly. It yeah. was a lot. Mm -hmm. So why do you think um, it's so popular um, now? And, and what has been the historical use um, of this medicine? Yeah. Um, historically, again, if you go out and do a little research, this one of the years I'd recommend folks, um, you know, do, do a little research. There's some great stories, um, but to be honest, nobody's actually pinned down um, the depth of the history, right? So there's some debates over it, but to me, it seems pretty apparent that, um, look, Yopo seeds um, are still being used in ceremony right now. They contain 5-MeO-DMT. We know there's multiple uh, plant tree leaf uh, species that contain 5-MeO-DMT, so we know it's, it's, it's contained in these um, different plant species. Um, but we've also seen paintings, we've seen motifs, sculptures, statues, other art, cultural art that would show or would lead us to believe that the toad was held in a high regard to a lot of these tribes. And that could lead you to believe that, again, this, this medicine has been used, you know, traditionally for thousands of years. But to me, more importantly to what we're talking about today um, would be the more current use of it. And it's significantly different than, again, any my understanding of any of the cultural uses. I mean, in 1936, it was synthesized in a lab and essentially put on a shelf. It wasn't until um, Albert Most, um, and there's a great show on this on Vice TV, I'd recommend folks go watch. Um, you know, Hamilton Morris did, I think it's a two or three part series on this, on the uh, beginnings of this, it's phenomenal. But um, to me, the watershed moment was 1983, the release of the book, um, you know, the psychedelic toad of the snoring desert, you know, Buf Alvarius. Um, it was written by Albert Most under the pseudonym of Buffo Alvarius, but it just outlined everything, how the toad was collected, how the medicine was collected, it was dried, the chemical compounds, um, how to uh, smoke it, uh, the experience, all these things that have really led to where we are today in the current use of it. 
Um, but it's also led us to why I'm here today having this conversation because I, my concern is about the current use of it, the sustainability of it, the safety of it, um, and a lot of other factors. Um, so really, I think 1983 was a watershed moment for the use of this, this molecule um, through this book, The Psychedelic Toad of the Sonoran Desert, where it really did outline the procedure for smoking it and having this mystical experience that we're talking about today. Sure. Um, is there any reason um, not to use the venom of this of this toad um, in terms of the toad itself, and then also in terms of just um, risks and um, you know contraindications that people may have to this experience? Yeah, again, uh, as we touched on earlier, I think it is the strongest um, energetic experience a person could have, and. To some folks that maybe aren't familiar with this world, you know, when you start saying energetic experience, it gets sound a little woo, but we'll, 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 we'll get into that. But uh, to your point, yeah, the, my concern with this watershed moment, this big moment was the importance of it again was to bring this molecule to the forefront and the ability to heal consistently in the areas that we've already discussed, I think is unmatched. But now we're at a point where we no longer need to use these toads venom for these experiences. As a matter of fact, I think it's um, completely unnecessary and it should be stopped, if I'm being honest. I mean, for multiple reasons. One, um, the pure molecule that's made in a lab is the pure molecule. Folks are looking for the 5-MeO experience, right? But the medicine collected from a Bufo toad is only about 15 to 25 percent um, of that. The rest of it is is actually other tryptamines and um, substances that are in the venom that aren't necessary. Yeah, so just a very small portion of that toad venom is actually the 5-MeO-DMT, right? So from a dosing standpoint, it makes it a little tricky. Um, when folks are stepping into this experience, one of the most important aspects of them to have a full experience, a full experience to me, which again, we could label as a the, the default mode network we're going to shut down the patient or the participant is completely shut down and they're having this near death um conscious extreme conscious experience well to get that they need a certain amount of the medicine the problem with smoking it through the toad venom is about again 80 percent of what they're ingesting is not the 5-meo and so a lot of folks struggle with getting enough uh, smoke in to have that experience so by using the pure molecule you're able to avoid that because it's about a, a fifth of what you need. Um, some of the other reasons is just simple. I mean, the toads are under you know, environmental pressure. Obviously, the monsoons are becoming less and less. Uh, water is being more captured and cultivated into more uh, organized systems, so there's less places for these animals to live and survive. And again, because of the increase in the use and the awareness of this medicine, um, poachers essentially is what I would call them, are putting these uh, animals under tremendous pressure and there is just no need to do that. Um, kind of the counters to that would be, well, the spirit of the toad is important. Um, I would counter that and say, well, if you're looking for the spirit of the toad, what type of spirit is a toad gonna be in when you're picking it up and stealing its defense mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the counter to that is, well, there's no harm being done to the toad, the toad's fine. But yet, if I volunteered to pick up most people from an audience and milk them, they probably wouldn't be too interested in that. So there's just no reason to do this. Um, and again, that's one of the things that as an organization we're really trying to rally behind is let's move away from this traditional uh, serving strategy, the serving technique of using this toad venom and move to something that's significantly more sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that information about the, uh, the toad itself. Um, Let's move that a little bit to the participant itself. Um, who might not be a good candidate um, for a Bufo experience? What kind of health, psychiatric conditions, a medication regimen, re medication regimen that someone might be taking that could um, cause them to have a negative experience here? Yeah, and and again, this is um, the strongest, most potent psychedelic on the planet. It's something that everyone should step into extremely cautiously. Um, and again, what I'm going to recommend to anybody listening, right, is I'll, I'll list out some things that, um, you know, if, if you're doing this or you're on this, that maybe you should avoid. But the right way to step into one of these ceremonies is working with a facilitator who's working with a doctor, who's working with your psychiatrist or other healthcare professionals to 
take the complete overview of age, health, um, past diagnosis, current diagnosis, current uh, pharmacology into consideration to find out what makes sense for you. But the, the 10,000 view is some folks that really may want to be cautious or folks that struggle with any form of mania, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, um, psychosis, just usually not ideal candidates. Um, other folks that, again, are a little bit more tricky to isolate are folks that to me really don't have a foundation um, for this type of understanding in the sense that if they are so believing that this is it, this, this is their identity, that there's nothing outside of this, somebody that really hasn't even dabbled in any spirituality, it could be too much for them. Mm -hmm. um, folks that are taking SSRIs specifically, obviously this is targeting the neurotransmitters, um, serotonin uh, neurotransmitters, so anything that's going to alter um, or adjust any of your serotonin levels is something that you need to be extremely cautious about. So again, that's where working with a psychiatrist would be uh, extremely important to either titrate off your medicine or, or find one that's uh, safer for you, right? Mm -hmm. And then just overall from a, a, a psychological standpoint, what, what would having a near-death experience do to you psychologically, right? Um, what would it do to you if your default mode network is shut down and, um, again, you, you've left your body? All right, and that sounds like a silly question to ask folks, but again, that's what you're trying to ascertain is if this person has a complete ego death, um, how are they going to land that? So again, folks that really don't have a foundation for spiritual work, I think should be very cautious, but that's the importance, I think, of the work that we're doing. We don't believe in one-offs. I, do, I don't believe in uh, somebody showing up, you serving them medicine, and then they going on, on, on about their way. I think this intake process is one that, again, we can have a whole conversation about how long that should take. It should be significantly longer, this intake process, to not only make sure that the medicine is safe for the person, but that they understand the experience, that they'll be able to land the experience, and then it gets into the integration of how do they make sure they land it and integrate that experience. So to me, these one-off experiences could be dangerous, um, and I'd say last from a safety standpoint, um, and again, we'll get into more specifics as we go through what a ceremony would look like, but asphyxiation, you never want to do this on your own. Um, that is one of the silliest things that I ever see. Folks that are willing to do this on their own, good way to die. Um, there's some physical ramifications too. Again, when you're offline, you could have a physical um, experience and just want to make sure that you're safe on that. But overall, an encapsulation, mania, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, um, psychosis and folks that are on SSRI should be very cautious um, before stepping into a, a ceremony. Yeah. Okay. And you, you touched upon it a little bit in your last response, but the um, the integration component of this experience, landing this experience. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what that that integration process looks like, and what are some of the tools that you use to help people um, post experience to kind of put it all back together and make it make sense? Yeah, and I guess we can blend. We'll, we'll blend the experience with the integration part of it. Um, it. You know, so from a participant standpoint, in a traditional ceremony, once we're actually in a ceremony space, right? The first aspect of it would be um, the inhalation of this medicine, which again could take up to fifteen seconds. But then immediately, um, the person's default mode network starts shutting down um, and they start uh, falling back, right? So to me, this first part is this inhale and this somatic experience. And during this somatic experience, I think that's where integration is beginning, right? In, in the sense that I think most folks go their entire lives and have never had an opportunity for their body to go back into some form of homeostasis, to have this energetic somatic release where they're just at peace and their body can now shed this excess adrenaline and excess energy. And in the animal kingdom, this is pretty common. As humans, we just tend to shove it down and deal with it. So to me, integration is already beginning as they're having this somatic experience as their body is healing, essentially, and going back to a, a more consistent baseline. It's almost like the analogy we use of the iPhone. Um, if you have an iPhone, when they've got new, up there, uh, new software updates, it'll shut your phone down. That's you. Phone shut down. New software is uh, uploaded. 
old bugs are removed and then you're turned back online. So very similar. So the first part is this somatic experience. That's when integration begins. Then after they land that, they start coming to um, this coming to awareness stage, right? This transcendent God movement, conscious movement. I'm one with everything um, is just now this realization of that that just happened. Um, and that also begins to me the first sign of the programming becoming visual as the ego coming together. And essentially what that feels like for a lot of folks is they're coming back online. They felt that they had this incredible one with everything experience, but yet their ego is trying to get back in there and say, did I say anything? Should I say something? What do I look like right now? Am I doing okay? And to me, when we're talking about the point of this conversation was egoic liberation, that is the beginning of the integration of that, is being aware of your ego in this crystal clear format of its separateness of you um, and its desire to restructure you. Um, and then folks move into an emotional release, all things that you've seen. And again, I, this is a point where the ego's tried to rebuild itself but they're having this, this, again, this realization that they are more than that, that they are outside of this egoic form, that they are consciousness, that they are one with everything. And that usually really leads to some sort of emotional release, either tears or laughter. And to me, this is also part of the integration process because for a lot of folks, again, especially a lot of the men that I work with, this is the first time they've had an opportunity to be purely authentic and just express emotions, feel emotions, um, and see the beauty of those emotions. And so that emotional release is, um, I think, just a side effect of interacting with unconditional love, right? So mm -hmm. that is part of the integration process. But from an official integration uh, process, right, in, in that process, I just mentioned that's about 10 to 15 minutes the journey right. itself is about 10 to 15 minutes but then the participant will sit there for 45 minutes trying to make sense of or an observation of again ego uh, unity consciousness everything that just happened and then our goal there is one to help them see the program right because again i think that's the power of this is this egoic liberation is again seeing the ego understanding how it's operating we're not trying to end it we're just trying to create a better relationship with it um so again see the program and that step to me is yeah so again this um going back to homeostasis this raised level of consciousness and this ego awareness to me is like one of the first steps of people's integration i call it seeing the program and then that space to reprogram right um, like as an organization, the somatic integration is important. Um, we're, we're always in our head. We're outside of our body. We know the body holds uh, all the memories. Um, so by going through somatic integration, it's not only helping folks make sense of this experience, but in their physical body, since it was an embodied experience, but also how to access that experience later, which we can talk about. Um, and then obviously the healing begins. The healing started the day um, they stepped into ceremony, obviously, but the healing to me um, with this one is, I guess one of the concerns that I have again about some of the, the research that's coming out is it's very difficult for some folks to immediately see what it's done for them, right? You know that, and, and you know, after you've had this experience, you can see it in their eyes, whew, something major just mm -hmm. happened. But if I asked you what happened, I don't know, right? It's like, and I don't know. Yeah. That's unique because there's no visual with this. But what's happening is your consciousness has been raised, right? Your, um, your ego has been just uh, become more, more aware, almost like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. It's like, shh, we pulled it back. You see it's there. You see that it's playing all the gadgets. You see that it's not as important as you thought it was. That starts to change everything. And even if it's this one percent change that we talk about again, if we use the analogy from New York to Oregon, I mean you're going to end up in Texas somewhere on this one percent change. So it's difficult to immediately see what's happening, but it is happening. And again, that is the importance of what we're trying to do. These one-off experiences. I meet more people that said, "Yeah, I've done five MEO, and I'm excited and I'm giddy about okay, what it do to you." 
I don't think it did anything. This has not been served properly. You've not been prepared properly. And you've not been integrated properly. You just had a dance with the most potent psychedelic on the planet, the most life-changing psychedelic, in my opinion, and it didn't do anything to you. That's our concern. And that's what we're trying to do differently is, again, how we bring people to ceremony, how we go through ceremony, and then how we integrate this experience in for real change. I mean, because at the end of the day, again, it is a essentially, in my opinion, a near-death experience. It's an ego death that leads to ego awareness on the highest level. Um, there is nothing more powerful for that. But if it's not integrated properly and it's not prepared for properly, it could be, unfortunately, a waste to some people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this will be my, my final question. Um, if someone is interested in being served by you, what is the process? Where do they go to reach you? Um, what do they expect as far as the um, a prep call, the intake, all the way through the experience and then their integration with you? What does that look like? Yeah, I'd say if anybody's interested, um, again, do research to nausea. It is the strongest, potent, most, psych uh, most powerful psychedelic. I'd say if um, you can go to YouTube, do some research on 5-MEL. I've got some good videos on our website, theunchurchchurch.com. Again, that's theunchurchchurch.com. If you go to the video sections, I mean, there's even a video on why not to do it. And I think that should be the first one that folks watch. We're, we're not mm -hmm. here to try to sell this to anybody. I think as a matter of, uh, of, of policy, we actually try to talk people out of this. Um, not because I don't think they should do it, but we're really looking for people that it's going to be safe and it's going to impact them properly, not folks that are just looking for one-off experiences. So I'd say do a lot of research, um, and then through that page, there's a way to contact us to reach out. And the process is, again, just reaching out. Uh, we go through a medical questionnaire, and then we just have a conversation about why, what's the intentions, what's this look like, what's the ceremony would look like, um, and does it make sense for you? Um, and if not, we'll try to help you come up with some other alternatives. Uh, the beauty of our organization, we're, you know, we've got partners with just about other, every other shaman, healer, facilitator, regardless mm -hmm. of the medicine. We've got just great connections and just great relationships with these folks. So the ideal is not for everybody to be a nail and us be a hammer. It's to find out what the right modality for you would be um, and then help you find that and do that in a trauma-informed, safe way. So I'd say start with the website, start with some research, um, and then, uh, again, you can reach out and we can have a conversation and see if it makes sense. Sounds good. Sounds good. And um, just finally, the conference, the upcoming conference, um, where can someone find you there? Yeah, the science of psychedelics. I should type this in. Uh, let's see. Phoenix Science of Psychedelics. It starts this weekend. I am speaking Friday afternoon around 2 o'clock, I think, 2.45. Um, but I'll be there all weekend. We're going to have a little booth. We're going to try to catch um, some folks for a podcast. Um, and just, again, this is an opportunity to, to spend some time with some peers, um, grow, learn, um, share what we have. And I've given about 45 minutes to talk. Um, I talked about as fast as I could talk this morning. I think it's taken about 40, 45 minutes. So that means there's going to be a lot of information that I won't be able to share, but I will have. Um, so, yeah, please seek me out. Love to have this conversation. And, uh, yeah, so this uh, this uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday in Phoenix, Arizona. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much. It's been a Thanks great informative it. talk this morning. And, um, yeah, looking forward to doing it again. Thanks for having me. Okay.